that box. Hello and welcome to Con Air, the podcast. I am Mark Hoffmeyer. And I am Jay Kluwer. And normally on this show, Mark and I will be flying through uh, the, the 1997 action classic Con Air scene by scene. But this is a sp- we're, we're taking a break from that format for this episode. A very special episode. Uh, Mark, who is joining us for this very special episode? Oh, we have an MVP today. Also, we have a fellow FSU alum. So uh, it's the wonderful Ty Granderson Jones. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I say. Star of Con Air, uh, played played Blade, one of the one of the cons in the air. Florida State, Florida State, man, Florida State. Go Knowles. Yeah. I was doing my research for this, and FSU popped up, and I saw you're from Tampa. You know, I grew up around Hudson, uh, and I lived okay. in St. Pete. And, oh, wow. Uh, uh, I was like, oh, Tampa. And then I was like, oh, yeah. Florida State. And, you know, FAMU, yeah. you kind of did like a joint. Yeah, thing, I, was, I, was like, I, was, I was a co-op student there. Uh, I did most of my studies at Florida State University. Um, and that's where I really excel um, because it was a Florida State University School of Theater. And as opposed to Florida a and University Department of Theater, it was just more. And so I took advantage of the co-op uh, uh, studies, you know, and end up uh, doing a, a lot of stuff at Florida State University. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm an alumni of both. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's where I met Lee Strasberg there. That's a, you know, an, another. You went to New York and you slept on the ground for three weeks waiting for Lee to show up. Yeah. That's some dedication yeah. right there. That, that's some yeah. respect. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. what Florida people do right there. Yeah. That's what Florida yeah, like, people no. sleep anywhere. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, I always wanted to get into film mm-hmm. and it's not back in the day. It's not like today where you can go and, Film acting and film school, everything was theater, you know. So I was a theater major, and uh, one day Lee Strasberg shows up to Florida State University with, uh, and I was so ignorant, you know, about you know any you know theater and and things and stuff, and uh, and and he shows up in in the auditorium of the school of theater, and we're sitting there, the whole student body school of theater. And and Lee Strasberg, who I really didn't know who the hell he was, um, he had brought Eli Wallach with him. Jeez Louise. Kevin McCarthy. And I grew up, it was like, I didn't know Eli Wallach. These guys come from theater, you know? And I knew Eli Wallach, all good, bad, and ugly. Western. <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean, Kevin McCarthy, the original the, the Body Snatchers. And and he had Earl Heinemann he- with him, who I didn't know because he was a big he was African American, but one of the most well known Shakespearean actors in New York, you know. And he had his daughter with him, Susan Strasberg, and Harold Carmen from the group theater, you know. And you know, this is the 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 constituents of Ilya Kazan and all these people. At the time, I didn't know any of this stuff. And uh, so he calls a few people up on stage and doing improvisation and things and stuff and workshops. And I I excelled. I was one, you know. And and I was just doing my thing, you know. And uh, and then about hours later, um, I, um, I'm walking across campus. I think it was in the spring. I had a fro, man. I'm really dating myself now, <laughs> which I, you know, and the wind was blowing and all of a sudden standing in front of the fine arts building was Lee Strasberg with, with a suitcase. I imagine he was waiting for a cab or something and going back to the airport where he was in New York and blah, blah. And I, and I, and I walked, it was a little guy, small guy like me, man, and, and, uh, had all his little wireframe glasses, and I walked up to Lee Strasberg, man, and I go, hey, man, you know, did you remember you called me up on stage and you did this, blah? Um, I said, look, when I'm, when I finish, uh, when I graduate, I'm coming to New York, and I poked him in his chest, I'm coming to see you. And he stepped back. I actually poked him in and said, you know, sometimes ignorance can work for you. Yeah, you don't it, know any better. I knew how great, and, you know, I'm like, here I am standing poking at least Strasberg in his chest. I'm coming in the door and I'm coming in. I was such a punk anyway, you know. <laughs> you know? And, he, and he took a step back, man, and he, he went, you do that, young man. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, man. You used to and, time that Florida State better than me. I uh, I worked as a bouncer and uh, was in some really terrible bands. And I applied for <laughs> I applied for film school with the dumbest essay. I don't even want to repeat how what I wrote in the essay. So you're like, uh, what was the street? Tennessee. Yeah, street? yeah, yeah, right on the street, right Tennessee on the Where strip at Big Daddy's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I worked I worked at the bars there, uh, yeah. and then uh, went to Florida State. I got a lit and uh, creative writing degree, and I went back for my master's. I got media and communication studies, oh, but. Oh. Yeah, but a fellow Noel on the show. And also, yeah. too, yeah. I just 
I just want you to know, it was it was 2020. Jay and I were on Deep Blue Sea, the podcast, and we were having a converse, conversation with Nick Dissemblian, who is now the editor in chief of Empire Magazine. And he okay. was talking about how they do a, tried to do a Con Air seating chart, but they failed. They couldn't do it. Right. So whenever I hear difficult. something like that, I went, I they didn't fail. It was just really hard. I'm not, right. it's really hard. I had to ask you for help. They, they do a monthly like, magazine. Gonna, They've always got yeah. things, they had deadlines. Exactly. <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? I got it. I'll, I'll do it. I, and then yeah. I worked on it for probably a month and I got totally stuck. And I ba- essentially cold called you, but Mace, like Ty, I, I was like, I sent you a cold Twitter message. Yeah. Yeah. And, you and you're like, hey, I'll look into it. The next day, you had the answer, you had the person, and like <laughs> you actually reached out to people and got me the yeah. answer, and that put together the final puzzle piece of the Con Air seating chart, and it got right. a lot of press. Like a lot of people loved it. People know right. it. Right. Yeah. So like, I, I'm just and, happy to have and you this on podcast because, happened. Yeah. And, <laughs> but you know what, man? I'm one of these individuals, these actors. I was telling somebody this other day. You know, I have a fan base between Con Air. I've done more than Con Air, more than, you know, other stuff and blah, blah, blah. And I'm fortunate that I have two classic films that are like my bookends, Con Air and CB4. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so wherever I go, you know, people are like, and they're always like, man, I can't believe you're so cool and blah, blah, blah. And I go, let me, let's turn that around. When people like you guys are reaching out, it's, we should be genuflex to you. You know, we should be humbling ourselves because people are giving us kudos for our work. And I just think sociologically it's a little backwards. You know what I mean? Because I think we, we actors and stars and people, we should be a little bit more humble that people that we did our job, our job, we entertained, we, we, you know, we, we developed a, a, a fan base. You know what I mean? So I go out of my way for anybody, man, that recognizes anything that I was a part of or anything that any of my pals that are stars or just noted actors such as myself were a part of and that need and say, hey, guys, you know, I mean, I've had to check so many of my star pals and go, look, man, that we're hanging out with little kids. I remember we were at the airport and me and Ving were going to Vegas when he, Ving Ving, when he was doing uh, Don King. And uh, we were flying on private jets because, you know, me, me and Ving, we were boys, you know, doing a thing, you know. And we were at the airport and walking through the uh, airport, and this little kid, this little white kid, comes up to me. And goes, hey, and was like, no, no. I said, "Yo, <laughs> yo, stop! Mm-hmm. Come here, kid. You know, you know, give this boy your your autograph, man. What is wrong with you? You know." And <laughs> and what happens is, I think a lot of us are so get caught up into this this thing of who we think we are, you know. And that's why a lot of my star pals don't deal with me to this day because I keep it a hundred, man. You know, I'm, I'll check them. You know, yeah. what do you, what do you, what do you, you know, what's, you know, you're very blessed, man. Come on, you know. So when you reached out for the season, I was like, yeah, it was it's, for me. It's a no brainer. It's like thank you. It's you know, I I worked in the industry for years. I did comic cons and I worked on film sets. And whenever I would talk to my wife about there being nice uh, people, like the bigger names on set, she's like, why are you applauding people for being nice? And I'm like, well, <laughs> there's not that many of them. <laughs> and right. So when right. you got back to me, I really didn't expect it, you know, but I'm I'm brazen enough to try. Like, if you right, don't right. try, yeah, uh, you're yeah. not going to get that answer. So uh, yeah. also, yeah. This, this is really random, but I just want to give one one story. Uh, I'm a big MMA fan. Uh, yeah. A big Mark Coleman and Kevin Randleman. I don't know if you remember them. They fought in the UFC and Pride. Well, you know, I'm a Muay Thai fighter, man. And, yeah. And so, I yeah, know. I saw you looking into that. And one day I saw him at the airport. I, I walked up to him. I just talked to him. I was like, oh, I'm a huge fan. I talked to him about their fights. They missed their cab. But then they came back, found me, and talked to me about MMA for about 30 minutes. I was just some kid sitting on a chair. And right. Two gigantic, you know, Coleman and Randleman were huge. Yeah. Two gigantic they're, they're, dudes. They're pioneers in yeah, the game. Pioneers, yeah. absolutely. Like ground and pound in the wrestling. And, yeah. But they came back and found me. And I talked to him about their documentary, his title fight against Boss Rutten, uh, just their fights that they had. And I, I, I it was weird. I, I remember that just being such a great memory because yeah. they came back and found me. It meant a lot. Yeah. Like it's, uh, yeah. I thought yeah. that was pretty cool. They're, they're, they're good men out there, man. They're two things, man. They're like, and I, I was on, I, I, when I coach and I teach, uh, the, not much these days, I always say, I'm, I said, they always say money changes and success changes you. I said, no, 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 it's backwards. It only reveals who you always were. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's one thing. It, it, money never changes anybody. 
It's just that, you know, the, excuse me, the dicks and the assholes become a little bit more comfortable in their journey to really expose themselves now. And they were actually in the closet, you know, so to speak. You know what I mean? Well, that makes total <laughs> sense. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, when you came back to me with that answer, I know almost every frame of Con Air. I just want you to know that because right. I tried to scour every frame of that. <laughs> and one day you came back to me at what, what had been working on for probably, uh, I don't know, a month. So uh, just thanks again. And and because of that, Jay and I were like, you know what? We should probably do a Con Air, the podcast. Let's spend 40 episodes talking about it. And so here we are I'm talking humble. to you. I'm humble, man. I'm humble. And I, and quite a few of the guys are humble too, man. Like Conrad Good. Yeah, and he, he helped MC. you. Like he, yeah, he yeah, was great. Yeah, Conrad's a great guy. MC Ganey. You know, uh, you know, they, he's, these guys, I mean, you know, we just had a 25th anniversary screening. Yeah. We, we had, was, uh, Brian Fish back on last week. He was like, yes, last it, week. It was so. epic, man. I mean, we were looking at each other. I said, can you believe this? <laughs> you know, you know, Angela showed up, Featherstone, you know, and everybody else were working. We don't know who ain't working, you know, so it was like, yeah, we, we'll show up and, uh, you know, but yeah, we, we're, we're, we're very humble, man. You know, I love it. It's just a very special, project to us you know it's like one of the last big action films we didn't they didn't use cg you know all explosions were real they carried us there was no drop pickup contracts they carried us for four months you know we made a load of money you know <laughs> i was doing this just as you said it like making <laughs> no, money. We, that doesn't even include and back then we had our rates you know, like casting, they know it. Nobody has any race anymore unless you're, you're a big star, you know. But back then it was like, well, what does Ty work for? Well, you know, he's 15 to 20 grand a week. You know, that's that's what he does. You know, he's worked his way up to to that, you know. Uh, so, you know, we all had our rates and 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 uh, and, uh, and 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 we sat around a lot, you know. I mean, action movies take forever. Blow, blowing things up takes a long time. And if you're yeah. on set. But, you know, second unit, first unit, you're making money. You're just sitting yeah. there waiting for them to yeah. prep a, a protein, yeah. a protein and, tank to explode. <laughs> right, right. And then the script was being um, retooled. They had brought some diehard guys in to retool the script in the middle of shooting, which is a no-no. And whenever you hear that, you know, script's in trouble. I don't know what the issue was. But because of that, we had a lot of downtime because I remember sitting on the deck. First of all, we lived in a... What was this town? Uh, it was the largest border town between Utah and Vegas. It was like, you're now entering, you just left. <laughs> you know, it was weird on the, the section of the highway. They had speakers on the highway because coming from the one or two casinos where we had to live, it was like, I never want to see another casino to this day because you had to wake up in the morning. <laughs> you know, you know, that's where we live, man. But it was, um, where we did the Bonneville Salt Flats, the, the big yeah. shootouts and the big explosions and all of that. Uh, we uh, Wendover, Nevada. Wendover, Nevada. It was the strangest town. So we're sitting on the deck at uh, one of the, the hotel, uh, the two hotels that were in on the highway on the strip. And we're sitting on the deck, me, Conrad, uh, all of us. Uh, Bre uh, Brendan Kelly, you know, who's, but a freight train would come by like every couple of hours and we would take wages. Uh, <laughs> no, how many boxcars? <laughs> we put put that money now. How many boxcars do you think it is? You know, the you know what I mean? I mean, we was just that, you know, and it would be like, you know, where there's 20, cause these trains are long, man, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, tw 20, 30 boxcars, you know, and we put money down and, 20, 21, the one that was closest, get the, the, the money. And then, you know, we were, I mean, we were just, I remember Scott Rosenberg, this particular day we were doing this, Scott Rosenberg was sitting out there with us, along with the, 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 uh, the VP, uh, of, uh, production from Disney. <laughs> and they probably, I'm throwing them under the bus right now. And, uh, and Jerry Bruckheimer's assistant. Uh, was looking for Scott because of rewrites, need these rewrites, you know, and <laughs> Scott pulled out, I think, a hundred dollar bill and gave it to Jerry's assistants. Tell Jerry you haven't seen us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just that crazy all wow. the time. <laughs> and that you downtime, know? you have enough downtime to want to count the cars on trains just to see yeah. what's going yeah. on. But when we work, we worked. Oh, you know sure. what I mean? Yeah, those are 12 hour days, you know, right? Longer than that because the sun. 
the sun, because they chose that location for several reasons. It was just perfect for the boneyard to claim the land, and then um, it was economically feasible, um, even though it was a $90 million budget around it, about there, um, and which was huge for that time. You know what I mean? We, but the days, because the sun came up, the sun set, the sun came up really early, and then the sunset was at 10 o'clock at night or something. It was weird. So you got all this daylight to get your shots, you know what I mean? And yeah, that's smart, right? Yeah. And it was 114 degrees every day. I mean, I was like three shades dark. I remember getting sunstroke one day. I, I mean, I didn't know at the time that's what it was. But I remember doing lunch. I'm sitting, and, you know, when we had a break and we're eating, and I'm, you, I couldn't tell you what my name was. I'm like, what well, this is weird. What's happening? I, and I look back and I go, you know what? I had heat stroke. You know, oh. it's 114 degrees every day, and we blowing up. Oh, man. <laughs> so double yeah. hot. Yeah, yeah. You know, Gosh. I mean, gunfight was real. Everything was real except the bullets. You know, and, they- and the intensity. Yeah. They just took out a ton of gear and just kind of plopped it out there, did they not? Like that was just that was a set no, build. No, no, no. That yeah, that set was I forgot the name of the set designer. That entire boneyard. I think his name was Ed something. Um, yeah, I can pull it up. Yeah, yeah. There was nothing out there. He he designed and built that boneyard, man. I wish yep. he would have put a huge boulder out there. So when when uh. Viking points to that rock. He's like, it's that boulder over there. Is that right, right, that's a rock. <laughs> right, right, right. It's funny, man. That uh, at that moment, that that scene when we were in the circle there. Uh, first of all, everybody had the one of the reasons why I, other than, you know, the obvious was, hey, it's a job. It was going to be a big breakthrough action film for me. And a lot of the guys involved, because originally the concept of Con Air was like a throwback to the Dirty Dozens. Right. You know, where everybody had their moment, the classic yeah. the Dirty Dozens with Ernest Bargain and Jim Brown and all of those guys. This is going to be the convict version of Dirty Dozen. And all of a sudden, um, you know, they brought in these writers and they started writing everybody, even the, the, the big star being everybody. Uh, just just chopped just and and uh i was so depressed there's a photo that i can send you guys where i'm sitting in the middle of the desert just in a little lawn chair all by myself and i was basically out there crying it on the phone to my agent on the cell phone that they've chopped i had a little monologue they've chopped everything pretty much and earl billings who played one of the guards came by he goes hey you working ain't you and yeah Say, you know, you're in a big film, right? Yeah, yeah. The hell are you crying about? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? But that particular scene, man, Malkovich, I'm gonna say Malkovich was such a great guy to work with. What star does this? He felt so bad for me that that particular scene, he gave me about three of his lines. Wow. Yeah, true story, man. Of course, those got cut too, <laughs> you know. And then, and then I am probably the line because I remember when when Conrad Viking goes, you know, well, what's that? And Malcolm says, "That's a rock." And I look up at Viking at Conrad, I go, "Duh, bunny kid." <laughs> 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 which, of course, is not in the film. Uh, which I was because because I'm finding ways to. Not too, right? to to get my dialogue back, you know, mm-hmm. and that's funny. The biggest moment in the film when I, we crashed in there, when I was just shut Bye. the fuck up, you free, we're gonna yeah. die. That was yeah. in yeah. total improvisation on my part. Hey, so you're oh. working it. You figured that's the way to get in there. Yeah, not only the way to get in there, it's just this guy sitting right next to me, Garland Green, <laughs> you know, talking about we got the whole world in his hands. And I told Simon, I said, Simon, I'm saying this is. And, and we're about to crash. I go, and we're just going to be there like in kindergarten and shut up. I said, it doesn't feel right. doesn't feel natural. I said, I'm going to say something. He said, what are you going to say? I said, just roll, Simon, okay? <laughs> <laughs> roll the tape, you know, if you don't like it. And everybody's like, that's just right on, you know? You know, the only time, the, the, the adjustment that Simon gave me 
which I didn't like, but I didn't want the scene to get cut because I did it hard. Shut the Funny. fuck up, you freak. We're going to die. You know? And he says, no, I want you to be, you know, you're scared. <laughs> so yeah. we're, we're going to die, which is what you see, which I hate. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I want to do, shut the Funny. fuck up, you freak. We're going to die. You know what I mean? But, and that's me coming from acting 101 instead of, and that's a lot of the difference that Simon, you got to remember, this was Simon's first film. He's a music video guy. He was a commercial, commercial yeah. guy. I don't know if you remember back in the day, back then, it was his big commercial that put him on the map that got Jerry Bruckheimer's attention was a Pepsi commercial. And it was about this little boy being sucked into the bottle. <laughs> you know? You know? And which was unique, different. You know what yeah. I mean? And uh, and that's what, oh, but Simon didn't know without, I'm not trying to disrespect him or anything. He was a visual guy. Yeah. Not an acting guy, not an actor's guy. You know, you have one or two or three kinds of directors. You have those that are visual, technically. You have those that are not so visual and that is just great working with actors, you know, performance and getting that. And then you have that third one who's just good at both. Yeah. You know what well, I mean? He was the visual at the time. First movie. Yeah, he was just visual. Me the visual. Yeah. yeah, he was visual at the time, ahead of his game, you know? So. Well, well, then he's lucky then that he got, you know, Ving Rames, you, Nicholas yeah. Cage, John Malkovich, John Cusack. Like, Buscemi. Yeah. Buscemi. I mean, you know what was weird? In 97, when I went to watch this movie, I was like, the guy from Say Anything's in this movie? I was like, oh, the guy from Leaving Las Vegas is in this movie? Right. Uh, you know, John Malkovich, I'm like, hey, In the Line of Fire is in this. And I'm like, oh, Ving Rhames from Pulp Fiction. I'm like, the guy from right. Fargo's in this. Right. And it, was, it wasn't just, this is Arnold, this is Sly, uh, this yeah. is this, this is, you know, a, a John Woo movie. I was like, yeah. what? I was like, yeah, Michael, is- Michael, T., Michael T. Williamson, who had done yeah. Bubba Gump. And, you know? and uh, yeah, I was like, for, you know, like Bubba, like Forrest Gump, like Bubba Gump's in this movie. You know what I mean? Like, I was, Bubba's in, like, it was, it was the strangest feeling for a 15 year old me because it, <laughs> it, it, I, it was the first time. Like I'm sure uh, I've done. <laughs> I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like it'd been done before, but it, it seemed like a character actor explosion in this movie. Right. Yeah, and it felt it was pretty cool. Like I don't know how'd you how'd you feel about that going into this thing? Like like well, 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 like I had, said, was that's one of the reasons I was excited about going into it. I knew that Malkovich. I knew that. Uh, well, initially, I don't know if you guys know this. The role for Baby O is the role that I read for. Ah, okay. okay. Baby O was written for, remember earlier we were talking about uh, South Central and uh, and uh, Glenn Plummer, I don't know, if, I forgot why I brought up his name, I'm from OG Bobby from South Central. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right, right, right. I brought it up. We were chatting earlier, I think, before we started really having this kind of discussion. And, um, the role was written, a baby O was supposed to be a small guy. It was written for Glenn Plummer. Ah, okay, okay. Who had worked with Scott already in a film called The Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead. Scott Rosenberg wrote that also. Right. Yeah. Okay, and, and was a producer on it. And so with Christopher Walken, Don Cheadle, and Glenn Plummer were the two young black guys hanging out and so uh, the way the story goes is Scott had written that for Glenn but Glenn was working wasn't available so uh, that wrote that and so it opened up and so Victoria Thomas brought me in to read for Baby O and uh, so they went off of Baby O and threw me one of the other guys you know what I mean they say well this guy is, is good he's great you know he'd be great Baby O but they got away from the physicalities of Baby O and just opened it up for those who were had more of a name and were more recognizable from bigger films, like Michael T was with Bubba Gump, who's a big guy. Michael T is one of my closest pals, by the way, you know, um, before Con Air. Uh, that's so great when you end up working with your pals. Yeah, yeah. be stuck <laughs> so, in the middle of nowhere hanging out with your friends at least. Yeah, right? man. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 you can't beat it, man. Can I, and, ask you, can I ask you a stupid question? No, no, there are, there are no stupid questions. So you haven't heard movie, it yet. <laughs> in the movie, Baby Odell is the worst of the worst because he's getting on that plane. 
Right. So the, when they're on that, they're like, he's the worst of the worst. And so we know we know Cameron's catching a ride. But right. they never, ever say what Baby O was in for. And right. he's apparently in for the rest of his life. Right. So what do you think Baby O did? Well, you know what? They, they they never say why any of us. Yeah, are, the new guys, yeah. You know, so yeah. we all came up. Matter of fact, it's funny that you would even bring that up because at, at one point, none of us had character names. Oh. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it was just, you know, co- you know, they were just trying to, they were, the script was what it was with bringing in the big star guys, but we need, they needed, these guys. So I remember we were sitting around one day uh, with with Scott as they were rewriting the script, discussing, well, what are you in for? <laughs> and what are you in for? You know, well, well, what would be your character name? <laughs> and what would be your character? We all kind of came up with our own names on the spot as oh, they were wow. rewriting. Well, we, we got to know what, what was Blade in for? Yeah. yeah. What, 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 what did Blade do? You know, he was he was a hitman, uh, an assassin that was great with a knife. Oh, I like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Which at one time there was a scene I had convinced them to when they're walking through the boneyard where I jump uh, from a place in the boneyard and and just started hopping on guys' back backs like a little <laughs> monkey and just slicing their throat oh, right oh, through it like a little. Which is why uh, and how. Simon came up with, and we're just sitting around one day, we don't, well, they aren't going to use that. They aren't going to shoot, boom, 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 boom. Hmm. And, and then they actually shot that one or two of those. And then we're sitting around one day for about, you know, in the morning. And then all of a sudden, the first AD comes and gets me and says, Ty, you know, based on your idea, because you're, you're the smallest and you're the quickest and you're great with the knives, but we're, with no knife here, says, you're the runner. You're the one that's going to go. So the scene where Daniel you run up to goes, tell Cyrus. Biggest company. Yeah. And I'm with, I'm digging the playing out with Ving, with Diamond Dog, and Diamond Dog, and you don't really see, you just see the side, a quick side of my head. Diamond Dog says, go tell Cyrus we got company. So then the next thing you go, know, and I hear I am I'm shooting this, half a day on a $90 million folk picture, I mean, with just me on a track running through the whole pole yard. And I'm like, man, this is gonna be so great. I'm all sweaty. I'm 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 yoked out, man, and I'm I'm running, man. <laughs> and then this is gonna be so great. And then I get there and I go, yo, Cyrus, and then me Malcolm's got this exchange and he tosses him his, his, his rifle so he can climb down and I catch it. Go, this is going to be so great. And then when I'm at the premiere, it's like, yo, Cyrus, out. we out. <laughs> Was that the heat stroke day? <laughs> well, I don't know. Might have been. <laughs> Might have been. You know what I mean? But, oh, uh, but, but, but yeah, man, it was, it was, uh, I was like, I thought, man, this is going to be great. We all had great stuff. A lot of us on the cutting room floor, cutting room floor. And there are about three or four or five guys that went on to have really, really big careers. You don't even, they were there just as long as anybody. Emilio Rivera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everything. You you barely see Emilio. You see him sitting on, you know, I mean, Emilio's a big TV star now, you know, with the Mayans and Sons of Anarchy. There was. Um, I love seeing him blow up, by the way, because he has been that guy. Yeah. Since what the early nineties, late eighties, just yeah. that yeah. guy in that movie. You see him blinking, you'll miss it, blinking, you'll miss it, blinking, you'll miss it, right, and now right. he has a TV show. Like that's yeah, yeah. that I love seeing that. You put the time in and then yeah. you just build sweetheart of a guy, man, that actually grew up. He's real deal. Just like I was a real deal in terms of my incarceration before Florida State. Uh he's he's a real deal from Frogtown, east side of LA. Major gang, heroin addict. He's been 30 years sober now. You know, I mean, and, uh, you know, tried to kill his wife with a rifle. He tells these stories himself, you know, and his son grew up in Frogtown, man. It's the worst part of L.A. with the, you know, with the, you know, homes, you know, you know, Simone say, you know, watch out, you know, those guys, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, and, uh, and he was the gang. He was the real deal. And then he went into the service and turned his life around and, here he is. He's 
he was at a, he was at my wedding, you know, you know, and, uh, nice guy. But and also David, uh, who went on to play a TV movie, Muhammad Ali, David. They were they were Earl Billings, a big guy. David I mean, Ramsey as Londell. Yeah, yeah, David yeah. Ramsey. Uh, uh, Danny Trejo, the reason why I went to a Florida um, flea market and bought throwing knives after watching Desperado. Right. So, uh, <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, which reminds me of the story with, uh, you know, we all would play, and I have to be careful with this because some is just not for public. But the bottom line is we, we all were pretty much a, a bunch of, whether we came from backgrounds where we, we we actually were a bunch of hard asses playing hard asses that that became actors now playing hard asses, <laughs> and when we all met up, you know it was a bit intense, okay. for real. Yeah, man. Uh, I remember almost. Uh, matter of fact, MC Ganey, I hadn't seen MC in twenty years until the screening, who played Swamp Thing, you know, and MC Ganey started talking about Brendan Kelly, you know, who's you know, and 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 I was a small next to Renly who was playing the gay, uh Sally. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, Renly, yeah. I was the smallest guy that wasn't playing uh, a a gay guy, you know, one of the hard yeah. guys. And 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 so when I showed up, you know, we all it was eating and 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 Trejo looked up and he looked at me and Brendan Kelly looks at me and, and all the guys and hmm what's 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 up with this guy you know what I mean and all of a sudden Brendan and MC brought this up and Brendan started taking food off my plate <laughs> what you know and you know he he was the big he was the big asshole who was going to try to bully the you know, the small guy, the small guy, you know what I mean? You know, and, and I'm like, say, hey, man, you know, this is, I, I wouldn't do that again if I were you, you know what I mean? And then he did it again, and then I leaped across the table, and Tre- Trejo grabs me, and he's like, hey, whoa, and then MC takes Bre- uh, Brendan uh, outside and talk, man, what is wrong with you? And they started doing it and say, you know, I know something about this guy's story. This guy will kill you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, and, and I had forgotten about some of this stuff, man. And MC wow. reminded me, you know, and, and you know, but we were a bunch of hard asses playing hard asses, and the one, and we were playing prank. I mean, one of the biggest dicks in the whole thing was Marty Mike Sorley. You know, you know. Not only remember the, the, the hockey stick issue. Yeah, the, 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 the <laughs> co-pilot. Exactly. The co-pilot. The pilot. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, Marty was he was nice, but he was that guy for real. And, wow. You know, you know, yeah, he played the pilot, man. And we were just all kinds of uh, pranks on each other, man, that which is cruel and brutal, you know. And the one that did not take, I remember we were sitting in the the Bonneville Soft Flats, and and they had like a, a canopy over us, and. Uh, you know, try to keep us out of the sun. And, uh, and it's 114 degrees and we're sitting there and Trejo's sitting in his chair. And I think, who was it? One of the guys, Billy, I think it was Billy Devlin, who played one of the guards, had cut a, like a little hole in the canvas right over Trejo's uh, chair. And he put a, a, a cup of water where Trejo's sitting in his chair. And the water's dripping on Trejo, man. And Trejo figures it out, and he gets up, and he grabs Billy Devlin around the throat, and he goes, I don't play, Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that. Oh, you know, man. Yeah, you don't want to get – you don't want his hands around your throat. No, 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 no. At least for Trejo, that was the end of it. The wow. rest of us were still, you know, I mean, it was just – and plus, y'all had a bunch of stunties too. You had a bunch of special effects crew, and they're pretty salty yeah. as well. So yeah. you have the actors who are, you know, what hard asses well, well, playing actors who are hard asses. Yeah. Then you have the stunties who, yeah. you know, and like any special effects crew you meet, when they're blowing yeah. stuff up, they're all rough. Like they're. Well, we had Navy SEAL guys oh, that geez. were training us. Gosh. And these guys would go in the evening. They were sitting at a different table than us, and we're looking at them, and they're challenging each other by 
take smoking cigars we're all smoking cigars and we had a club and they we're challenging each other i mean they're challenging each other we're playing pranks on each other these guys are actually taking cigars and seeing who could take it the longest you know i mean they're coming to the set the next day with all band-aids and gauzes and <laughs> wow <laughs> you know i mean you know it was it was like it was it was what you see on the screen is, but it's real shit happening. So you know, there's levels, like, right? Right. There's levels. Yeah, but but the, the, the thing about it, the beautiful thing about it is most of us to this day, all of us, there's a brotherhood. We're so close, man, and love each other, you know, because we kind of knew how, how special it was then, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Bruckheimer was, um, just, just Bruckheimer was just a class act, man. I mean, there are times, man, we were like, hey, Jerry, uh, can we use, uh, can you get your pilot to fly us to Vegas just for, you know, the day, you know, we're not doing anything. And he let a couple of guys get on the jet and fly to Vegas, you know, and, and on his private jet, you know, and, and, uh, I remember when we, we, we were coming back in, when we left the Bonneville Soft Flats, we had to come back to L.A. to do interiors, which we did it at Hollywood Studios off of uh, Las Palmas and um, Santa Monica Boulevard is a studio over there to this day. Did they just put you on like a big gimbal on there? Like, it was a, it was a design. It was a it was a plane, the interior of the same plane design, but it was like <laughs> Disney. It was it was you know it was yeah yeah it was electronic. It was serious oh, money yeah. you know. And uh, but when we flew back in, we had all been together for a couple months, you know, like in Wendover, Nevada, where we were doing things like there was the only place in Wendover, Nevada to hang out. Was like a store, a store, a storefront um, strip club called American Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a true story, man. So we all like, well, what are we going to do? Well, the only place to go is American Bush down the street. There's this little strip club where all the women are beautiful, but they're missing the teeth like on meth. <laughs> you, know? you know, but they're beautiful until they, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we're in there, man. And, you know, we got this per diem, you know. And next thing you know, by the end of the night, all the strippers are sitting there watching us, Bashimi and all of us. We're the show. We're stripping. We're Bashimi. Everybody, you know, we're we drunk. We're lost our minds. We're bored to death. And we're we're dancing, and the strippers are in chairs watching us. <laughs> are they paying you? <laughs> they're bringing them back. <laughs> True story. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the door to the club opens, and it's like. <sighs> <laughs> right, like we didn't realize we had been there all night and we're late for our call time for one of the biggest shootouts and it's the AD looking for us Bob Wagner guys where are you you're supposed to be on the set right now we've been in this little strip club all night long <laughs> so wow. we had to go straight to there straight from there hung over straight to the set to wardrobe to a big gunfight all day long in 114. <laughs> that's the heat stroke day right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a true story, man. Oh, you I know, love it. That's by awesome. the end of the evening, man, we all be in macho and everybody's go, hey guys, see you. Yeah, we haven't seen them in the tomorrow, right? That day, and as soon as I know, as soon as I walked around the corner of the hallway, I was bumped over like, oh, 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 Jesus Christ. <laughs> You know, and no sleep, 114 degree weather, 14, 16 yeah. days out on the salt flat. Drinking all night, oh. you know, and pretty and physical no stripping and dancing for strippers all night. There's <laughs> no shade out there. Like, in, uh, uh, you probably had a silk over you, but or like, you know, tents. Right, but right. sometimes you're working on those concrete sets and you're getting hit from above and below. So yeah. You don't, you don't have that nice uh, break. So you're getting hit. Oh, but, man. But, but what I want to say, what I was about to say is when we flew back in from there to do the interiors before we went to Vegas, uh, we, we flew, it was a, a big a chartered jet, a big like Boeing chartered jet. And me, Malkovich, Cage, the whole cast and the crew, some everybody's on that plane, man. And 
all of a sudden we're flying back into the the back end of LAX. And uh and as we're getting closer to the ground, we were like, what, what's all these lights? And as we got closer and closer, and then we land, Bruckheimer had a limo for every actor on that plane with their own driver standing. Oh. Oh. It was just classy. We all looked at each other and teared up, but we all had been together so long. You know, we, we were like, well, it was like, bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we had become like, oh, girl, bye. You know, because we had our own, the, the guys were standing there with our names and they're pulling up on the tarmac uh, to the jet. And we all just getting our own individual. We've gotten so used to being together. And it was like, well, can can you ride, come ride with me? <laughs> can you come in my, but we had all, but Bruckheimer, he treated from the supporting co-starring cat, all of us, he treated us no different than he treated Malkovich or Cage. Bruckheimer was just, he's just a class act to work for, man. You know? That's great to know. That's why yeah. he's had a huge career. Then. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. I guess you don't have that long of a career if you're not a class act like that. Right, Jeez, right. right, right. So we, we knew that, man. I, I remember one night he, he, we were, I, I think it was when, uh, somewhere else. I think it was in, uh, cause it went over in Nevada before we got to the Bonneville Salt Flats, which is where the big, you know, the boneyard and the fight, which by the way is where Steve McQueen raced all of his cars. Oh, nice. You know? Um, and ironically, Steve Mc, Terry McQueen, the late Terry McQueen, Steve McQueen's daughter, who was beautiful, who we lost from some type of cancer. She was a very close friend of Conrad Vikings. Oh, wow. And she would visit us. She would fly out and visit us on the Bonneville Soft Flats where her father raced with a box of cigars for us all, for all of us. Oh man. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Cause she would bring Connie, uh, Conrad, uh, these, uh, these cigars and, and, and guys cigars and she sit on the deck with us and, 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 and so forth, you know. But, uh, but I remember, uh, Bruck, Bruckheimer brought out, he bought out a, um, a particular nightclub. And it was like a hole in the wall with, uh, sawdust all over the floor, one of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember, people forget Dave Chappelle was in Con Air. And I remember we all walked in and Dave looked around and he go, man, I feel like I'm in a scene from Hee Haw. <laughs> <laughs> And we all just fell out, you know. True story, man. Some of this stuff you just can't make up, man. We've had some uh, some Chappelle heavy scenes recently, and we we always praise him. He's he's the MVP of the uh, the first half of the film, in our opinion. He's he's fantastic. Right. Yeah. He does all the yeah. work. He lights, you know, he lights. Uh, what what he calls them? What coaches on fire? He right. He opens up the cells. He has the clipboard. Like yeah. he, he, he gets rid of the transponder. Water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had lived quite a bit of that, a little bit, you know. Some of that, you know. Uh, but we we had a ball, man. And, and the the most hilarious part was when we were in Ogden, where none of us were working yet, really, because that's where the the uh, the scenes mostly with Angela and and uh, Kuzak, Kuzak and yeah, those guys, yeah. you know, in the, sandals. In the office scenes and stuff. So we were just hanging out, watching and around, but still we were there. That's where they flew us in before we went on to other places. And we walked on the tarmac and tarmac and um and getting on this big private jet. And uh Malcolm and every everybody, you know, and but nobody really knows anybody yet. And a really, really bad storm had come. And raining and lightning and thundering. And so the jet's turning around and we're waiting and, and it's really pouring. And from Ogden, because of the mountains, the, traje- the trajectory for this plane has to be a certain, you know, it's just straight up, man, to get over the mountains. And it's thundering and lightning and 
the plane starts just shaking. And I remember Trejo took out, he takes out a novena, a novena. <laughs> and starts, you know, doing this. And then, wow. and then, and then I looked over at Chappelle and Chappelle goes, Oh, funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I'm all like, well, you know, a bunch of actors playing, and it was almost like the line, it was almost like the line of Bushimi. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, right. yeah. yeah. you, know, <laughs> you know, listen, you know, and did you start you know, singing? He's got the whole world in his hands. Did you start right, singing right. that during and, that? And, yeah, but but with, yeah. what was the line where he said, how about it, how ironic it is? Yeah. They're listening to oh, yeah. <laughs> song made famous by Giant yeah, by yeah. Russia. Yeah. Like, you know, they're and I'm thinking at that time when Chappelle's going, oh, I don't like to fly anyway, man. You know, I'm like, there's some a bunch of actors playing convicts that take over a plane, don't quite get the movie made, they crash in the plane while they're on the plane. <laughs> So uh, 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 Trejo has said in another interview that uh, on the set, John Cusack was the most kind of intimidating guy out there. Would you, do you agree with that? Or is there anyone, anyone uh, else? Uh, <laughs> I mean, intimidating how? Uh, he just said he was the one, the most like scary to be around, like uh, against all the ones that are kind of playing criminals or like playing uh, the bad guys in the film. Cusack was the one who like was the most intimidating. I don't know. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think Trejo was uh, on the level with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Simon West said recently that uh, that Nick Cage was the one who was the most competitive, the most kind of macho. What, well, what, what well, do you think? Yeah, about that? I don't. I don't. I don't agree with that either. I remember Nick kind of not to us, but it had gotten around the set because you know, especially through you know, like being a Muay Thai guy. You know, I've been fighting since, you know, a kid and this stuff. I really bonded with people don't notice, you know, who choreographed Benny the Jet. Benny the Jet. Benny the Jet. Benny yeah. one of the greatest Muay Thai fighters in the world. Hell yeah. And me and Benny got like this, you know, and so I got around through Benny and it was like because Nick had in his in his um contract and his uh what do you call it? Uh Rider. Rider. In his rider that uh you know, he had a a gym and a semi truck, 18 wheel. And so wherever we flew to, that truck had to be there because that was Nick's gym to stay, right? Well, he cried because we, we just took it over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, so, hey, we, oh, that's only Nick Cage is going to work out in here, man. Look, we, look, we're working out in this piece today. <laughs> you know, he could, Nick got a problem, come talk to us. We're in there hitting it, all of us. <laughs> Me, uh, Diamond Dog, Ving, everybody, and it was just kind of like, and it seemed to me, to my recall, Nick was a bit more intimidated about not even <laughs> approaching us about it, you know. Um, he but just worked out with you guys. I mean, I, let me guess, did Steve Buscemi have the biggest best bench press out of everybody on the cast? Well, we never saw Steve work out at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So, see, we we had to stay buffed out because we were, you know, mm-hmm. supposed to put our shirts off. Yeah. You know, which brings me to the story that um, she, I mean, um, he, the, you know, the people forget the storyline of Con Air is just one day. Yeah. Pretty much. But it took us four months. Mm-hmm. So by the time we started shooting at 114 degrees, when we crashed into Vegas on that one summer day, it's 14 degrees. Whoa. You know, because we're shooting this in November. And you're crashing into the water as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and uh, and 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 we're being spritzed. You know, uh, uh, we got the, the 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 big coats and, and, and jackets and so forth. But before before uh, we were right about maybe three or four or five minutes before, you know, uh, action. They spritz us down so we can look sweaty like we were all summer long. And we was freezing our asses up, man. You know? You know? And then, you know, action. Cut. Oh, look at what it's saying. <laughs> you know? That's, that, that's how it works. That's real acting. Yeah. yeah. Those yeah. temperature changes out west are severe. Like, it gets gnarly right. out there. Right. It, it, yeah. Good, yeah. Good uh, question uh, for you. Whenever I watch Con Air, I pretty much always forget 
that there's a fire truck chase. Like in Speed, I always forget that there's a train scene at the end of it. Right. Right. Do you do you forget about the fire truck chase too? I know you're not in that scene. You had been arrested by then, but it's always a surprise to me every time I watch it because well, it's on a plane I, forever, and then you're on a fire truck chase <laughs> and on the strip. Right, and, right. And then like MC Ganey gets put in a fish tank. Right. By John Cusack. <laughs> right. And I never, I never remember it. I do. Yeah. So when you watch no, it, I, you go, oh yeah, the fire truck chase. Yeah, I, I remember it because I remember that's how Malkovich dies. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> that, that, that's crazy. You know what I mean? And the Don't thing worry. comes down, and and those scenes were I heard were added on later. It feels like because it. the movie the movie ended where it ended, and I think the studios were uh, if I get this right, um, her, felt that it needed more of a heart ending, you know, to, to take Malfish <laughs> out and all this kind of thing, you know. A fire truck chase. <laughs> <laughs> right, but the ongoing story is that you know, you know that even at the screening, um, it was like well. MC and, and Conrad at the screening got into a debate because they're saying if there's a sequel, MC is saying Swamp Thing made it through. <laughs> it was like, no way did you make it through, man. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the only guys that really survived were Garland Green and you're and in the me. Yeah, Sally. Me. Sally uh, I'm, looking, big, I'm looking at the big uh I'm looking at this right now on my on my wall. Oh, nice. You know, those are the guys that survived. Yeah. You know? Sally. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Those are the guys that survived. And I got that from, that was one of the, uh, one of the big, uh, when they did the big rap party, they had these everywhere, you know? So I'm like, I'm taking that home. <laughs> He's not surviving. I know we don't see Diamond Dog dying, but he blows up. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, a motorcycle runs into him and he explodes. So right. maybe he yeah. got away. <laughs> but I love that Cyrus shoots through a walkway, gets electrocuted, and then lands on top of a concrete smashing. Like he has that three has deaths. No business being there. No yeah, business. Yeah. Being there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but see, that's what's so fascinating to us, man, because. We feel like the film is so ridiculous in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's so ma many different things where, you know, th there are so many holes in the film. You know what I mean? But yeah. it still stands up. You know what I mean? I mean, nobody. Well, how did how did this guy get on the plane? When did this guy get on? When, when did we not see this guy and that guy? You know what I mean? That's why Ramirez killed me on the Con Air seating chart. They never show him. And then right. he's there. I remember right. watching going, wait, who's that? Uh, right, 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 right. Yeah, they, they just chucked him on there. But you know why I think this movie works is it, it's the, the tiny moments. Like you, they hired the, the best actors for this, I think, because you watch Malkovich, you, like, you watch Cage, you watch Buscemi, like every, everybody in it, like they all right. really earnest and on when you watch it. Like everybody's right. really committed. And, with a lot of these action movies, I think sometimes people, you can tell a tongue in cheek, but this one didn't, right. really, I don't know, everyone was just committed and added a lot more than what, because this could be a stock, not, this could have been a, a, like a hard rain or, you know, like kind of a forgotten 90s action film, yeah. but yeah, yeah. I, I love but you know, rain though. But well, you know who, who was uh, in contention, the, the, the other two stars that was in contention for uh, Cyrus the Virus, it was, uh. Bruce Willis and Mickey Rourke. Yes, Mickey Rourke we know about. Yeah, <laughs> the knife he, story. Yeah, Mickey he, he uh, took a knife to a guy's throat during his, his yes, audition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he came in. He came in and brought a uh, <laughs> uh, a big like a Bowie knife. Yeah. To to when he went in yeah, to meet Cy Yeah. And and he slap stuck it down into the desk. <laughs> he, you know. And Simon and everybody just got freaked out and said, I don't think we want this guy on the set. <laughs> yeah, that's too intense. That's, uh, yeah. you know, you said sometimes you got to hold it back. Like he, yeah. he turned it, like, you know, go to 11. He went to 12. And yeah. And brought a Bowie knife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but um, I remember when, you know, I never officially became a, uh, a member of, um, uh, the actor studio 
It's a long story. Uh, although Lee was inviting me to, I was like the last group where he would do these uh, uh, special, uh, you know, because he wasn't doing much at the time. Matter of fact, he had done Godfather 2 and 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 and, and uh, he was retiring, spending a lot of time in L.A. I heard, which is why, um, you know, I, he wasn't, it took me so long waiting for him. He wasn't in New York, you know, he wasn't showing up every day. But uh, I, of that group that I was in that I get, I get, I had the opportunity to go in and, and watch the class and get up and do something, uh, a little sort of an audition in front of Alec Baldwin you, would come over from New York University. Wow. And Mickey Rourke was in the class. <laughs> and he had come, he was, uh, remember 42nd Street in New York when it was nasty <laughs> and dirty, you know, all the little slot machine uh, strip. Uh, and Mickey was a bouncer. Uh, had a job working on 42nd Street. As a bouncer? As, as at one of those little slot joints. No wonder Back, was tough. This is before it. You know, just studying, you know, studying and stuff. You know, we is for his career has taken off and his career took off. I'm going to grad school and things, and but whatever. But I remember one of the other students in class got freaked out because Mickey would actually come because Mickey was a bouncer at these joints and he had a 38 and he would come to class with a 38 in his belt. <laughs> okay. You know, wow. <laughs> You can't make this up, man. Oh, he lived it. You know, <laughs> can't make this shit. But we 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 spoke even to this day every now and then because we he was from Miami, Florida. He's a Florida boy. Hey, you know, I like that. Florida boy, you know. So we got and, that East Coast thing. No, we we're, we're West Coast. We're, yeah, uh, yeah, we're and the West then, Coast guys. And then back in the day when I was riding Harley and stuff, back in the day we would ride when he was doing Marlboro Man, and I was out here hooked up and I had my little Harley and then uh, his brother, Joe Rourke, we all would ride together, okay. you know, and, uh, and, and that kind of thing, man. But uh, no, nah, man, it's, 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 it's been a journey, man. And I'm, I'm a play. It's been a, um, a real pleasure to uh, have been a part of something like Con Air and to be a part of it, you know? And, and thank you so much for, for joining us. This was an awesome chat. Yeah, and, yeah man. You, you yeah. Been, you've been so cool. It still throws oh. me off. I still feel like oh. you're. I, I still feel like something's gonna happen because you've been so friendly. <laughs> like, I was like, what's 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 gonna happen here? Uh, but no, I, I mean between the seating chart and just scheduling this with us and uh, yeah, making no, yourself man, available. I'm, I'm, I'm humble. I'm humble, yeah. man. Yeah, I mean, really us Florida it. State. Us Florida State guys. Yeah, yeah, and there are quite a few of us out here, man, that are rocking and rolling, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the guy that's directing a new Planet of the Apes movie did all the Maze Runner. He went to FSU. I think yeah. Barry Jenkins went to he FSU. He went to FSU. Uh, you know, know, I've, I've been trying Barry. to track Barry Jenkins down. You know? <laughs> FSU connection. So yeah, I mean, so, yo, yo, man, I'm a no, man. I got a script that I need you to read, Barry. You know, it's so hard, man. You know, once you get out here and get in this game in the circle and everybody starts putting up their defenses and the agents and the managers and, you know, but it's just it's part of the process, part of the game. And this OG is still standing, man. And I'm not done. Uh, and um, and I, I got some 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 cards up my sleeve, you know, and. I love it. Things, uh, get that Western made. Get that Western made. Yeah, and I have a series uh, that's going to pop up soon on uh, Amazon Prime, man, where I'm recurring on it called Sangra Negra. Hey, awesome. Okay. I'm definitely watching that then. Yeah, a gangster thing called Black Blood. Uh, and uh, ironically, I play the henchman assassin sidekick to Glenn Plummer's, who was going to be the original baby O. Well, oh. me. Me and him are playing. I'm his sidekick and henchman in this, you know. Oh, can't so, wait. Yeah, so it's the dots, man. You know, and well, uh, uh, and and here we are, man. And uh, and I'm so blessed, man, to to be a part of it and do what I do and the way I'm doing what my journey has been. And the the great part is that having been taken under the wing of people like uh, um, Sydney Port, the late Sydney Portier, and Robert Guillaume, and even to date, man, I just went to Richard Roundtree's 80th birthday party, and 
Glenn Turman, all these guys, even Ronald O'Neill, Superfly, took me on his wing. Oh. So I was doing all this theater, and they would come out and see me on stage. Go, who is this? And they all, all the OG, the double of the real OGs and pioneers, African American and Latino, because I'm half and half. Uh, I've been so blessed, man, that these guys that when I was a kid watching them, uh, I mean Ben Vereen. I mean I, I just got a text this morning from Ben Vereen, you know, and, and all of these guys, man, I, I still pinch myself that they want to know what my opinion is. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you can you can add Jay and I to the list now too. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, it's all good, man. I'm, hey, so I'm where where uh, can people find you before we get out of here? Uh, where where can people find you? Um, you can find me on uh, Instagram, uh, King Creole fifty five Creole baby, Fleur de Lis, King Creole fifty five, Ty Granderson Jones on Facebook, Ty Granderson Jones on uh, Twitter. Yeah. You know, awesome. and um, you can also look at my company website at www creolesalinaint.com that's c-r-e-o-l-e selena c-e-l-i-n-a int for entertainment e-n-t dot com and see what my company is doing I have a little award winning short film that I, I wrote, directed, co-starred in called Diamond which is currently streaming on Amazon Prime I'll uh, link to that when we write the post yeah, yeah, yeah it's a, it's a 14 minute award winning short film about a, about a female operative that goes after conservatives that are trying to mess with women's benefits. You know, <laughs> something I came with way back before any of this. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but it's called Diamond and people seem to like it a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I'm looking for investors for my projects. My scripts are fire, man. Help them out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, hey, thank yes, you so, please thank reach you. out to me for anything. I mean that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be relative to Con Air, <laughs> you know, uh, in terms in, in, in regards to your writings and things and looking for connections or whatever you guys are doing. Um, I'm here to support you as well. Awesome. And uh, so, we got to talk, we gotta talk old Henry sometime. OK. Yeah, yeah. definitely, man. Definitely. Awesome. Well, yeah. uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, yeah. Jay, do you want to, do you want to get us out of here? Yeah. Uh, so, um, well, should I put it go from it? Uh, thank you very much for, for, for Ty Grant's chance of joining us. Uh, I've been yeah. Jay Kluwer. And I'm Mark Hoffmeyer. Come back next week or the bunny gets it. Ty. Anara. <laughs>